I'm not going to ask who got the better end of the deal because that would be a matter of opinion. <laughs> but the name of the game says it all. Let's make a deal. People would dress up in totally weird costumes just to get themselves noticed. Because if you got noticed and if you got selected, you got to sit on the deal floor. And on the deal floor, Monty Hall would come out and he would offer you one thing. And before you really, really knew what you had, he would offer you something else. And well, guess what you had to do? You had to make a choice. Funny how we keep coming back to that word. You had to choose. I mean, she said, I'll take the money too, but what did you tell her? It's an either or. You can have the box or you can have the money. And well, sometimes in that game, you walked away with a little. Sometimes you walked away with a lot. And sometimes you walked away with absolutely positively nothing. The thing is, is you had to make some decisions. Funny how our choices and our decisions came, seem to define our lives. So uh, we're going to continue our series today, and we're going to talk about this idea of being selfie Center. And last week we introduced the person that started out as Jacob the deceiver and then became Israel, the, the one that wrestled with God. We looked at a few snapshots of his life, and as I promised you, now we're going to go back and we're going to look at these episodes in Jacob's life and we're going to zero in and we're going to focus and we're going to zoom in so that we can see how his selfie-centered nature defined himself in hopes of learning something about our selfie-centered nature and how we tend to define ourselves. And you know what? Today we're going to talk about the worst deal ever. Now, if you have your copy of God's Word, you can make your way to Genesis chapter 25. That's where we're going to be. There's not a lot of bouncing around, but this is the story. And remember, we started here last week, but now I'm going to kind of build on the story that we started last week. When the time came for her to give birth, her being Jacob and Esau's mom, this is Rachel, there were twin boys in her womb, and the first came out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay home among the tents. Isaac, who had had taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. That's interesting. They had a his and a hers. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick! Let me have some of that red stew. I am famished. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he, he being Esau, swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. It's kind of nice he threw in a slice of bread with it. I mean, oh my goodness. Do you realize what happened here? Esau just gave away something that was precious for something that was almost worthless. He came in and he saw the bowl. And you know what? Sometimes we need to beware of those bowls that we're looking at. Because they're everywhere. You see, Esau had been out there, and as many of you probably are doing these days, hopefully you're having successful ones, but maybe you've had some unsuccessful ones. It's hunting season when people go out and they sit in the woods and they look for critters to, to shoot. I don't know why you have to go looking for them. We found plenty of them on the side of the road. You can hit them a lot easier than you could shoot them, but 
you know what? People like to hunt, and I understand that. But Esau went out on one of those hunting trips, and he came back in, and he'd been sitting out in the woods all day long, and he got absolutely, positively nothing. And he's, here he is, and he comes in, and he is hungry. And so he looks at his brother, and his brother's been home, and sitting at home, and making stew, and cooking, and he's got this big pot of beans a brewing. Uh, we got a little bacon grease, and now he's Jewish. He doesn't have any bacon grease. <laughs> but he's got some kind of seasoning in it, and he's got it all set up. And, and Esau comes back in. He's like, hmm, that smells mighty good. Give me some of those. And I think here is where we begin to see Jacob as he really is. Because what should the proper response have been? I mean, your brother comes in, and he's been out hunting, so that's going to provide the meat that you're going to eventually cook. And he's coming in, and he's hungry, and he asks you for something as simple as a bowl of beans. What, Jacob, what should Jacob have said? Here. I mean, here. It's yours. I mean, we're talking family here. But Jacob doesn't say here. He looks at it, and he says, you know what? Let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. You have a birthright that I want, and I have a bowl of beans that you want, so how about we just trade? Tell you what, that's the most expensive bowl of beans that he ever had in his entire life. I hope it was at least an all-you-can-eat buffet where he could come back for a second bowl. Because he was about to trade away a birthright for a bowl of beans. You see, Jacob offers him, asks him for an exchange. Now, is it a fair deal? Absolutely not. Not if you just think about the money involved in it and what was going to come with it. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you have to wonder, because short-sighted Esau says the birthright is no good to him since he's dying of hunger. And he agrees. He agrees to give this precious birthright to Jacob. And I just have to wonder if Jacob had already seen something in Esau. I just have to wonder if our little deceptive con man Jacob, who mean, his name means deceiver, had been watching his brother for all of this time, and he knew that eventually he would be able to trap Esau this way because he laid the trap perfectly. You almost wonder maybe he got up the night before and ran all the deer off somewhere else. That way the trip would be unsuccessful. He'd come back in, he'd be starving. You wonder... How, Esau, how Jacob just knew Esau would be willing. You see, the writer of, I'm getting ready to run out of battery here, the writer of Genesis even said that Esau despised his birthright. Now, that word does not mean that he hated his birthright. Esau did not mean that, it did not mean that Esau hated being the oldest. Esau was not tired of being the person responsible. It says that he despised his birthright because Esau did not value what had been given to him. After all, who was responsible for Esau being born first? Not Esau. If anything, it would probably be mom. I mean, mom's the one that had to sit through labor. She's the one that deserved the birthright because she's the one that actually did all the birth and the boys were just along for the ride. But because he came out first, this despised birthright meant something special to Esau. It meant Esau's birthright gave him a double portion of the inheritance. Since there were now two boys, and the boys in, the, in, that, in this culture were the only ones that could receive inheritance, there were two boys, so what was going to happen when something happened to Isaac, that, that all of the money would be split up into thirds? And then Esau would get two-thirds, and Jacob would get one-third. So, so this precious birthright meant that Esau had the right to, sell, to have everything, to have double what Jacob had. Now I want you to think about this. When he sold it for a bowl of beans, what's he going to get? Well, he doesn't get a third because did, Jacob didn't trade, trade birthrights with him. What's he actually going to get? Nothing. He got his bowl of beans and he got nothing. He gave away everything. He man wasn't even smart enough to say, okay, I'll trade you, but I want yours in place of that so I get the beans. He just traded it for a bowl of beans. Something that you could go down to Kroger and buy a bag for like a buck and go home and cook them. He traded away two-thirds of his dad's inheritance. And remember, these people were loaded. There were camels and donkeys and people. They had slaves and they had money and they had wealth. And he just traded it all 
for a bowl of beans. See, he gave it up for a single moment. It wasn't just about the bowl. He traded it away for a moment because I'm hungry. I want it. I need it, is what he told himself. What good is a birthright if I die because I'm hungry? And what looks like the worst deal negotiations in human history, Esau gave up so very much for so very little. But I'd like to tell you something. This is not the worst deal ever. It's not. It's pretty bad. I mean, it ranks up there. The worst deal ever, though? Well, we talked about this verse last week. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Now, I told you we were going to come back and told you this is one of those stake pens for this particular sermon series. I even said this might be a good verse for you to try to commit to memory and remember where we found it because this is one of those points that you need to understand. The worst deal ever is when I give up my soul for what I get in this particular life. And you know what? While I've never traded a birthright for a bowl of beans because I was the third kid. Well, actually, I was the first son, so technically I should have the birthright. I should let my sisters know. I was the first son, so I'm entitled to two-thirds, but there's really nothing that I have, so it doesn't really matter. But you do understand. I've never traded away a birthright, but you know what? I think I might have done this sometimes, where I've given up a piece of my soul. Or I've given up a piece of what God wants me to be in exchange for something that is only about the here and now. And this morning I want to talk about this particular bowl, how we need to beware of it, because there are several things as we look at this story of Esau and Jacob and this bowl of beans that was traded for a birthright. There are several things that I think I do, and so I'm going to kind of make an assumption that everybody here kind of does the same things. There are things that we trade, some bewares that we need to have when we begin to talk about what it means to gain this world. Because you know what? I've got a lot of stuff in this world. And if I started to think about how much that stuff probably cost me in my time, my energy, I'd probably have depression. Because you know what? I think I've probably given up a whole lot of my life. And I don't have a whole lot to show for it. So the first thing I need you to see is we need to be, to, we need to be aware of making the mistake of growth for maturity. Now, here's what I mean by that. Um, Genesis states that Esau and Jacob grew up. So they were born babies. But remember, babies don't stay babies forever. Um, Eventually they grow into toddlers, and then they grow into terrible twos, and then they go into the trying threes, and then they go into elementary school, and then they become middle schoolers or preteens or whatever we want to call them these days, and then they become teenagers, and, and they all grow up. They don't stay little forever. And the Bible tells us this happened to Jacob and Esau. They grew up. Now, a lot of times when we do this story in VBS, we, we get the wrong notions because we show these strapping 20-year-old men out here arguing over a bowl of beans. You need to understand something. Um, they were 60 years old when Esau sold his birthright. 60 years old. So Jacob had been plotting this for 60 years about how to go about depriving his brother of a birthright. 60 years old. So we're not dealing with immature Teenagers were dealing with grumpy old men who never grew up because they're still arguing over a bowl of beans and a birthright. They can't figure out how to be with each other, and they're just so consumed with themselves. You see, because Esau grew in his hunting skills, but he did not grow in his relationship with God. Man, he became a, sp- a spirited bow person. He could go out there and hunt, although he must not have been great because he came back unsuccessful. So, you know, but I guess it was just one of them days. Everybody has them. But he became a, sp- a skillful hunter. But as you read through the book of Genesis, you never see Esau with any kind of relationship with God. As a matter of fact, after this event and after the blessing event that follows it, we see that Esau went the exact opposite way of what God had told him he did. So, He never grew in his relationship. He grew up, but he was just immature. And well, Jacob, well, you know, Jacob wasn't much better because Jacob learned how to make a mean stew, but he never learned how to stop stirring the pot for his own selfish attitude. 
Yeah, he could cook, and it smelled good, really good cooking, and he came in there, and it looked good for the presentation, and it was good to eat. But, but you do understand, underneath that, he never matured because every time he had a chance, he stirred the pot to try to make the situation work out for himself. Esau was just the victim this time. There were a few more in his life because this is who Jacob is. Jacob is all about the here and now. Jacob is all about what's in it for me. Jacob is selfie centered You see, you need to know that we can grow up on the outside but stay very small on the inside. We can grow into fully grown adults, and this is not only in the physical sense, this is in the spiritual sense. I can grow up and I can be the oldest person in the church, but you know what? I can still be very, 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 very tiny in my relationship with God. And oftentimes we, we see it like seniority. Because I've been doing this for so long, and that means I'm at the front of the line. That's not the way faith works. See, God wants you to grow up, but he also wants you to get more mature. He wants you to have a relationship to actually grow. See, we need to ask ourselves if we've really grown up or if we're still governed by the childish and selfish behavior and impulsiveness. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 reads this way. Instead, so instead of your selfish attitude, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. I look at this verse and it always brings me in awe because you do understand in that relationship, it says Jesus is the head, but we are the body, we are the hands and the feet, and the lungs, and the voice, and the toes, and the ears. And the head is completely mature. The brain is mature. But how's the body? Are we still trading bowls for beans? Are we still trading beans for birthdays? Are we still just doing those things that, that I want to do? Are we still living selfie centered you know, not only do we have to beware of mistaking growth for maturity, when it comes to my relationship in Christ, I have to beware of unsatisfied appetites that become exaggerated emotions. Now, here's what you need to see. Esau got in trouble because he got too hungry. I, I got to tell you, I'm not a very nice person when I'm hungry. You know, I come in sometimes from work and, you know, I, I missed a lunch or I missed a snack or I missed something that I didn't eat enough that day. And you know what? I can be a bear. I know you have a hard time believing that, but I can be very grumpy. And when I get grumpy, I tend to get very loud. I can even be a little mean and insensitive at times. I know you don't believe that, but it, it happens. You see, when you allow your body to get too hungry, then things begin to happen. You see, he was so hungry, he was willing to do anything to satisfy his appetite. When I come in from work and I'm too hungry, and I know I've got to fix dinner, and you know what, we've got a good dinner plan. Before I fix dinner, do you know where I usually head? The pantry cabinet. You know why? Because in there, there are nuts and potato chips and crackers and cookies candy. Well, not candy. Candy doesn't do much for me. But there's all this stuff. And so you know what I can find myself doing, right? I can run in and I can stuff some of that stuff into my face and I can fill my body with the junk. And then I'm like, okay, now my appetite's done. Now I can go fix dinner. And then you go fix dinner and you're like, I'm not very hungry anymore. You know why? Because I just traded my future just to satisfy my appetite. And this isn't just about being hungry. You see, he wanted to, an immediate gratification. There's a reason they call those things in the pantry comfort food. Because I want to feel good now. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. I don't want to wait for eternity. I don't want to wait for my relationship to be done. I want it now. Now is when I want to have it. Give it to me. And I don't care what it costs me. You see... He became dramatic. Now, surely none of us have ever done this, right? 
when you're too hungry and you become dramatic. And he says, oh, woe is me. Surely I'm about to die. I'm so hungry. I'm going to die if somebody doesn't give me something to eat. I've had my kids tell me that. I assure them, your body can go about 40 days without food before you die. You'll be fine because I know it hasn't been more than 40 minutes, okay, because I still see the crumb trail. Okay, I understand. You, you think you're about to die, but you're not. But this is what we do, don't we? Because we smell the beans cooking. We see the bowl. And you know what? I'll trade. I'll trade. You see, hungry lives, when we get too hungry, everything gets blown out of proportion. Oh, my gosh. When I'm hungry, everything is more irritating. When I'm hungry, nothing satisfies me. You can come in and say, Dad, I got straight A's on my report card. Look, they gave me $500. I'm hungry, okay? I ain't got time for that right now. I'm, I'm not interested in that because I'm focused on one thing. I've allowed myself to get hungry. And I wonder how many times we've got some Christians that are trading their birthright for bowls because their life is just empty. You let yourself get too hungry. Maybe you're not too hungry, but maybe you let yourself get too lonely. Maybe you've moved yourself away from, from God's family or you've moved yourself away from people. You've isolated yourself from people because you're afraid you're going to get hurt. You're afraid you're going to get let down. You're tired of all of that, so you isolate yourself. And then you get just too lonely, and then you know what? The first relationship that comes across, you jump at it. Whether it's one that's going to bring you closer to God or pull you away from them, you jump at it. How many times have we, we saw this, that people get themselves into a relationship they don't know how to get out of simply because they were too lonely? I wanted somebody, and well, they were available. Maybe you're too tired. Man, you want to know when Satan can take advantage of me? Let me get tired. You know, when I'm worn out, Satan's waiting for me. See, this idea of getting overly burdened, overly hungry, overly lonely. You see, what happens is when I'm in, in, in our hunger, our emotions are exaggerated, and we begin to settle for things we normally wouldn't even think twice about. When my life is empty, I'm lonely, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I begin to settle for that. When God tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, He, He being God, humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. It's funny, when Jesus was all alone in the wilderness, and he was tired, and he was hungry, and Satan came and he tempted him, and he said, hey, look, you're God. You have every right to not be hungry. Just take these stones and turn them into bread, and then you can feed yourself, Jesus. This is the verse Jesus turned to. This is the one he quoted back to Satan. This is the one he said, I understand I can in the moment do what I want, but you do understand the bread isn't going to fix my problem because I need to have my relationship with God. But in my self-centered nature, what do I usually choose? The bread. The bowl. The beans. And that's because we need to Beware of the temptations to give up what you want most for what you want now. Oh, my goodness, how many times have we done that? As you read this story, after Esau sold his birthright, it says he ate the stew. You know what it doesn't say? Did he enjoy it? Did it taste good? Later on that night when he was sitting there and he began to think about that bowl of stew and he just thinking he actually came to his senses and the drama was all gone. How do you think he felt about that bowl of stew then? We know he became angry with Jacob, but Esau had nobody but to blame himself. This was his choice. You see, that's because the bowl always looks better in the moment than it really is. See, in the moment when I'm famished and I'm starved and I'm lonely and I'm tired and I'm hungry and I'm irritable and I'm grumpy, the bowl looks great. Why? <laughs> I'm solve my problem for now. So I'm willing to make the trade because you know what? Tomorrow can worry about tomorrow. 
I got to worry about today. And you know, in the here and now, we tend to value what we can touch, taste, see, and hear. It's like this little rice bowl that I have now here. It became valuable to the people in that village because it was going to feed them for a day. But you know what? The next day, they still had to have this to go back. And they were done. And in the here and now, we the church, we the Christians, we tend to value the things that I can consume in my life today. And although we say it all the time, you know what? Tomorrow is tomorrow. And you know what? Eternity is eternity. If I can just make it till I get to the bed at night, I'm all good. And so we trade. We make deals to get the things that we want, those things that we think will satisfy our life, whether it be a job or the house or the car. We do it. You see, Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 25, puts it this way. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. And i got to tell you something. Confession time. I've made that trade quite a few times in my life. I've, I've traded that thing that God wanted me to do for that thing that I thought I wanted to do in the moment. Only to find out later that that was a stupid trade. Because what I got just wasn't that valuable. What I got didn't satisfy the need forever because guess what? The need came back. And the problem is, is when the need comes back, i got to make another deal. And when the need comes back again, i got to make another deal, and another, and another, and another. And this is where Romans kicks in. I just keep making the deals and keep selling off a little bit of myself, piece by piece, until eventually it says I become a fool. Because I've traded my everything for nothing. Absolutely, positively nothing. Sure, I might have a meal for today, but I've given no thought to eternity. <sighs> I'm afraid we all make that deal. And you know why? Because um, Satan wants us to. He wants to trade bowls for birthright. Now I keep using that word birthright, and you're probably thinking, what's this birthright thing we're talking about? Did you know when you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, when you choose to follow him, there are some things that come with it. Some birthrights, if you will. Some things that you get that come attached to the relationship. So I'd just like to give you a preview of what you're trading for the here and now. You see, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we have a birthright, a spiritual inheritance. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 says, For this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set free the sins committed under the first covenant. First thing I get is forgiveness. The first thing I get is I get Jesus saying, you know what? These consequences of sin, these things that you think are going to happen, i got a better deal for you. It's your birthright. If you're a follower of Christ, you are entitled to your eternal life with him. Man, that's a pretty good thing, isn't it? That's a big birthright. You know it gets better? Not only are you just entitled to go and live there, you know what it actually says? 
See, in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, it says we possess everything that Jesus possessed because we are joint heirs with him, Jesus. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Do you get what that's saying? I'm not just going there to live. You understand, I bought a timeshare. I'm part owner in the place. It's a birthright. We are joint heirs with Jesus. What he gets, we get. We have a share in our life. Man, that's pretty cool, isn't it? What are you selling it for? What do I have to give you to get that away from you? Let's make a deal. Because you know what? It gets better because that's not all you get. No, there's another box. There's another curtain. So let's open it up and let's take a look at what we get. Romans chapter 5, um, he sent a down payment to us. It's called the Holy Spirit. And this is what it says. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given, given to us. Not sold to us, not bargained to us. It was given to me. So look at what I've got. I've got three things I've opened up here that are mine. They're mine. Jesus said this is what the relationship is all about. But here's what you need to know. For every birthright, Satan's got a bowl. For every promise God's got, Satan's got a deal for you. When it comes to that peace that the Holy Spirit's given us, you know what? We choose to sell our peace for our worrisome thoughts. We choose to sell the, the peace of God to just worry about this world and worry about the things, worry about how I'm going to take, my life, take care of my life. What did Jesus tell the disciples? Why are you worried? God takes care of the birds. He takes care of the flowers. What do you think he's going to do for you whom he loves? But you know what? We make the trade. We listen to the whisper in our ear and, and when we say, you know what? I'll trade my peace so that I can worry about it. We sell our joy by eating from the bowl of things to grumble about. The Bible says that this relationship with us, with God, this relationship should bring me joy in my life, should make me content. You know, I'm amazed at how many times I sit down, I'm guilty as everybody else, and there's a group of Christians sitting around the table, and about two minutes into the conversation, we find something to complain about whether it's the political climate in the country or sin out in the world, whether or not it's the fact that we don't like tax, tax rates, whether or not we don't like our job, whether we're having problems with our spouse, whether we don't like our kids at the moment, whatever has happened, you know what? Give me a couple of minutes, sit down with me, I will find something to grumble about. And you know what that is? That's the trade. That's the trade. Satan has offered you the thing to grumble about. He knows the second you eat from the bowl, what you traded away is the joy. Because now I'm not satisfied with this Christian life. God's not meeting my needs. You see how this works? It's very subtle. We sell our testimonies by indulging in our temptations. Oh, wow, how many times have I done this? I don't even know how I can count that high. When you know what? I've got a chance to do something that will, go, that will bolster my testimony, give me a chance to share God with somebody else, to share Christ with somebody else. And you know what? I trade it for the idea that somebody upset me and I lose my temper and I blow my testimony because I open my mouth before I open my heart. I cannot tell you in my life how many times I've done that. But you know what? I make the trade. I trade away the good thing God gave me for the fact that, you know what, I have the right to be upset. Okay, you do. You're an American. You have that right. You have a right to do this. Sure you do. You can trade it the way any time you want. It's yours. God's not an Indian giver. He's not going to take it back from you. But you know what? It's yours to trade. And I think Satan just keeps pounding us in this way. Let's make a deal. I'll trade you my bowl of beans that will feed you today for your birthright of eternity. This is what Esau found out later. 
Esau found out that um, his birthright was a little more valuable, and he went back to get it. And you know what it says? He went to Dad and told Dad what happened, and you know what? Dad said, I'm sorry, I can't give you back what you sold. Doesn't that break your heart? If you sell it, God's not obligated to give it back to you. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 through 17. See to it that no one falls short of grace to the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Ouch. Really? I can sell it all in this lifetime and then I don't just get to go to heaven anyway? It doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. You mean just because I'm a good person and I come to church every single Sunday, that doesn't mean that that God's going to let me go to heaven anyway? No. It doesn't. Just because I've memorized half the Bible and I can sing every song in the hymn book, I'm, I'm not... No. No. See, the only thing that gives you the birthright is the relationship. That's the nature of a birthright. And so I guess what I want to know this morning is what's your deal? Here's what I want to know. What would I have to give you to make you not come back here anymore? $100? $200? $300? A new car? A house? A trip to Hawaii? Lifetime, get $100 a week for the rest of your life? What would I have to give you to make you say, you know what, I don't need this Christian thing anymore? A spouse? A kid? Mom and dad live forever? What would I have to guarantee you to say, no God for me? Because you do realize whatever it is, it's nothing more than a bowl. Because what you're trading away is a birthright. You see, I think that's what we miss. We think I can just trade it away and then I'm going to come back to God someday and say, I didn't mean it! I didn't mean it, God. Do over, mulligan, second shot. And we're going to stand up there in front of God that day and say, I didn't really mean it. God's going to say, with tears in his eyes, I'm terribly sorry. You made your choice. It was your decision. Jacob did not steal Esau's birthright. Esau gave it away for bold means. And I often wonder, are we making the worst deal ever? And giving up so very much when this world offers us so very little.